lesson three. In lesson three, we are interested in another area of ancient education. We call it Hebraic Christian education. The word Hebrew is familiar to all of us. The Hebrews, are, uh, their story is told in the Bible. They are very important people in the Christian life. And the ancient land of Hebrew is also referred to as Palestine, Canaan, Israel, or the Promised Land. Very famous in the Bible. Then for the Hebrews, they were monotheistic. That means they believed in only one God, Yahweh. This belief was sustained for a very long time. Before they entered Canaan, they, had, they found the Canaanites who were worshippers of idols. The Canaanites had developed very important cities like Jerusalem. Then the history of the Hebrews is legendary. All of us have, not all of us really, but most of us who have read the Bible know the history of the Hebrews. It is full of legends, beginning from Adam and Eve, down to Abraham, down to Moses, down to David, and then to Jesus Christ. Those are the legends, and they make the history very legendary. It occupies an important part in the history of the world. Of course, you know, there are many Christians in this world, they believe in that story. The, the Hebrews were the founders of the systematic study in history. They believed in only one God, and for them, they had a divine purpose. So their story is, is actually a story of responsibility given by God. So they had to do everything as instructed by God, regardless of whether they were suffering or not. If you have read the Bible very well, you know they went through very many sufferings. That one never made them deny their God. And uh, under Hebraic Christian education, we have the education now, which connects modern education with uh, Hebraic education. Then Judaism is a Jewish religion. It is one of the oldest religions in the world. It has very many followers. Then due to their practice of monotheism, their life was centered in their belief in God, their relationship with God. So actually the Hebrews did not have much time for politics, economics, or other things. Their story is actually a religious story. Then the education was aimed at character building because they were God's people, they were supposed to be role models to the rest, and they were supposed to do according to the will of God, whether in calamities or whether they were in good times. Then, to illustrate their deep respect for labor. Even before God, human labor is very important. You look at the prominent Jewish personalities, all of them had some occupations. A good example is Jesus Christ. He was a carpenter, just like his family. And then Saul of Tarsus was a tent maker. Peter was a fisherman, ETC. So human labor is very important, even before God. And then we have, in the beginning, where there were no formal schools for them. Later on, schools came up, and of course, they were not replacing the family, but they were rather supplementing what the family has been doing as far as education is concerned. So schools were to assist the families as far as education is concerned. Then you have Christianity and education. Those of us who have gone through Christian schools know that uh, the basis of education is actually Christianity. So the birth of Jesus Christ was a fulfillment of a historical a religious prophecy that, was, that has been recorded in the Bible. So the Jews believed that a Messiah would come and save them from their difficult situations. This Messiah was Jesus Christ. So it was a cultural belief, and this story was told orally, even before it was recorded in the Bible. So the main source of information about Jesus Christ are the Gospels. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They record the story of Jesus Christ right from the beginning. After reading the Gospels, you realize that some information has been left out. So the information we have about Jesus Christ is very fragmental. So there are some bits and pieces that you don't find in that record. And then Christianity had a great influence on history and education. And if you look at education today, we, there are many things we do today that are based on Christianity. A good example is the way we conduct our classes from Monday to Friday. We leave Saturday and Sunday for worship, and that one is a Christian practice. 
And then this Jewish education was the foundation stone for the Christian tradition in education. So even in our education, we do very many things based on Christianity. The Gospels give us a picture of Jesus as a greatest teacher in history. Jesus was able to match his teachings to the level of understanding of his audience. And you know his audience consisted of very many groups of people. There were children, there were elderly people, there were middle, middle-aged people. So he was able to match his teachings to the level of that group which was made up of very many other groups. Then we have Islam and education in Africa. Of course, even before we come to Christianity, we should appreciate the fact that Islam is older than Christianity as far as education is concerned. Muslims came to Africa even before the Europeans. So the Arabic language and records help us to understand contributions of Muslims towards education. So if you are able to get hold of the earliest recorded history of Africa, those records would be in the Arabic language and not in English. So the process of Islamization, that is converting people to Islam, was done through the activities of individual Muslim scholars and teachers. They offered themselves to come to Africa, go to the interior parts of Africa, and establish their faith among the societies. So the 19th century witnessed a series that is one after another of jihads or holy wars. This was led to establishment of Islamic institutions of learning among many African societies. So our oldest institutions of learning could be Islamic institutions. Then we have early migrants who established their groups along the coast. And today, you can tell a Muslim home from a Christian home because of the designs that they were very fond of putting on their homes. So you can actually tell a Muslim home from a Christian home, especially along the coast. Of course, they intermarried with the non-Muslims, although they have still maintained their very strong cultural practices. Then you have Islamic education with aims and objectives. First and foremost, Islamic education is aimed at moral and character building. Academics may not be very important for them. What is important is the moral and character building. So they actually insisted on that very much. So the first and highest of Islamic education is moral refinement and spiritual training. So Alana is supposed to be morally trained and also spiritually strengthened through education. So each lesson is supposed to stress on moral aspects and every teacher considers religious ethics above everything else. So for a Muslim teacher, when you enter class, you're supposed to stress on the moral aspects. And a lesson is not complete unless you stress on religious ethics. So Islamic education is also focused on secular issues of life, such as marriage, family, wealth, etc. So according to them, as long as we're in this world, we need those secular issues. We need the marriage, the family, and wealth above, not even above. We have the spiritual life, first of all, then this other life is also important as long as we're in this world. Then you have the curriculum of Islamic education. So Muslim scholars and educators studied science, literature, and arts. Although those studies are not as they are today, they have undergone a lot of development. Then Islamic education also promotes vocational and industrial training. They believe that we need some of these skills so as to make our lives better and to improve on the way we do our things. So in general, secular aspects of education are expected to promote the spiritual functions. So spiritual functions first, then secular issues come in to help us develop the spiritual functions. Then we have the structural levels. There are three of them. We have the Quranic schools, equivalent of what we do in our primary schools. We have the ilm or secondary. That is what we do in our secondary schools. Their level is known as the ilm. Then we have the university. Anything post-secondary to them is what is known as the university. Then uh, the major features of Islamic education, of course, is very different from what we have today in our modern education. It is marked by not having any structures. 
It is not structured according to age. Like this time we know, to go to class one, you have to be of this age. For them, you can join it at any age. You can access it any time. That is one of the important features. It is not structured according to age and can be accessed any time in life. Then it is not competitive as there are no entrance or completion examinations. They don't have the KCP and the KCSE that we know in our modern education. Then access does not depend on ability to pay fees. You can get Islamic education free of charge. One thing any Islamic scholar or teacher knows that is their God-given duty to pass on their learning to the learners free of charge. If you can afford something, fine. If you cannot afford, you are still welcome to class to learn. Then class attendance is flexible and is organized between the teacher and the, the learners. So they agree on when to meet. So it is flexible, you can access it. We do not have a sick timetable. Then class attendance, that is what is very flexible, organized between the teacher and the learners. Then Muslim teachers are usually held in high esteem, very much respected because they are essential in the passing on of the learning. You cannot get Islamic education without a, a teacher. So their teachers are held in high esteem, very much respected. Then it is not, it is not as diversified as we have today. It is very homogeneous, very uniform. Things are done in the same way all over. It is widespread. You can find it in any part of the world. It is characterized by great motivation. The learners are self-motivated. So we have Islamic education once again. How has it contributed towards modern science and technology? First and foremost, we have in art and architecture. You will know their designs look very unique. Like if you pass near a, a mosque, you can tell a mosque from a church because of the beauty of the designs. Then we have in mathematics, of course, the Arabic numerals and decimals belong to the Islamic education. We have another contribution in physics. They introduced the pendulum and they advanced global knowledge in optics. They are very good opticians as a result of uh, Islamic education. That is in astronomy, they were able to establish astronomical stations. In chemistry, they discovered very many substances that we use in our lamps. Then in the world of manufacturing, they are known for their very beautiful designs as far as utensils are concerned, the pottery bit of it. They are able to design very good uh, designs for what to use in our kitchens and in our houses. Then in design, they come up with very good colors, very good decorations for ornaments. Then you have in farming, where they adopted scientific methods, they are very good at, as far as farming is concerned, they can of course reclaim land, they also use a bit of irrigation. That is the end of our lesson three. Thank you for listening. And now proceed to the last lesson, that is our lesson four. Under lesson four, our interest is education during medieval times. Medieval means Middle Ages. The Middle Ages are between the years 1000 AD and 1500 AD. We refer to them as the Middle Ages. So from ancient times to the Middle Ages, then to what we have in modern education. So education in the Middle Ages was governed by strict orthodoxy. Orthodoxy means strict rules and regulations, which if you defied, you excommunicated. I would equate this to what we have in our Roman Catholic Church. A rule like celibacy is an orthodoxy. If you choose not to get married, you don't get married. That is what you are calling orthodoxy. Then if you don't get married, you are excommunicated from the church. You no longer belong to the church. You either go to and begin your own church, but you cannot continue being a, maybe a Roman a Catholic father if you are married. Strict orthodoxy which results in excommunication for those who cannot observe the rule of celibacy. Then we had uh, an institution known as knighthood. This was an honor given by the British king or queen so that a man is able to use the title sir before his name. So before you become a sir, you have to go through knighthood as an institution. And it was very important in the Middle Ages. These knights had their own way of life and they had their own education. Early education of medieval knights 
those ones who are preparing to become sons in future. And they began in the home with a mother or a local priest teaching the young boy simple prayers as well as obedience to his elders. When the boy was seven years old, he was sent to the castle of a secular lord or to the palace of a prominent churchman. Here, he joined the family and performed the normal duties as a family member. We call them page boys. We see them in marriages. These young boys who are usually near the groom, they assist them with their with the light duties. So this was the role of the young boy at the age of seven years, serving as a page boy in the home of a priest or a secular lord. In this home, he learned etiquette and was instructed on nightly behavior. Remember, he's going to be the star in the future. He started learning it in the home or uh, the palace of a, a local home of a local priest or the palace of a secular lord. At times, this young man would uh, be visited by wandering singers. Singers who do not have a station, they were moving about visiting homes. So when they found a boy in this home, they offered him lessons on music and playing of musical instruments. He was also engaged in outdoor activities such as wrestling, horseback riding, and such outdoor activities so that he can enhance his physical skills. Before elevation to knighthood, the young man served for several years as a square. A square is a young man in the Middle Ages who worked for a knight. Remember, he's preparing to become the sign in future. He now concentrated more on physical exercises and ignored his aesthetic interest. That means, in the long run, his interest is physical abilities, not actually how he looked. The physical appearance was not important. What was important was the strength and the skills in warfare. Then education, education institutions in the medieval times. We divided them into two categories. We had a category under the control of the church. These ones adhered to the rules and regulations of the church. One of them was the cathedral schools. Then you have the collegiate schools that were established by a group of churches. Then you have the monastic schools, more or less the same as the monasteries we have today. You have the song schools. The major role was to train people who assisted the church in musical services. Then you have the chantry schools and the parish schools which were established in major towns. Then you had another category that was not under the control of the church. These ones were the special schools established by guilds and uh, the merchants. You have noblemen schools which were established by the noblemen for the direction of their sons. You have the lay grammar schools. They concentrated on teaching grammar. You have the law and history institutions. They taught the law and the history of their societies. Then you have the Bagra, the Bagra vernacular schools. These ones were actually associated with the rich and famous men of that time. You have castle schools, which were established for the education of the daughters of the upper class. Then you have education now, education in medieval times, the courses covered at universities. One of the courses was astronomy, botany, zoology, physics, and chemistry. Very important courses even today, although what we have today in those courses may not be what they had in the courses at that time, very many changes have taken place as far as technology is concerned. Then you have the seven, seven liberal arts. They were divided into what you call the trivium and the quadrivium. Trivium means three. Quadrivium means four. So we have the seven liberal arts divided into the trivium and the quadrivium. And... Uh, under the seven liberal arts, we have dialectic. We have a, that one is a form of argument, which is actually based on reasoning. Then you have the rhetoric, that is the, the art skills. You are very good in speech. Then you have grammar. We have arithmetic. We have geometry, astronomy, and the music. Philosophy and theology were part of the seven liberal arts. Then you have medieval teaching methods. And that these teaching methods, we use them even today, like in the formal lecture. What you're having right now 
is a very good example of a formal lecture whereby the teacher talks almost throughout as the learners listen and take down notes. That one is a very good example of a formal lecture used in uh, medieval times. You have the students' debates whereby you are given a task by the teacher. You go and sit as a group and debate it among yourselves. And most of the arguments are very philosophical. You always try to support your argument. Then you have public disputations. We know them today as defenses. So before we, before somebody goes through a master's or a PhD, they have to do what we call public disputations. You have to defend your thesis uh, before a panel of judges. That is very, very similar to what was done in public disputations. Then you have strict examinations. Even today in universities, we have very strict examinations. Although they take a very long time, the, the rules are observed very strictly. Of course, you know that uh, these examinations can have some malpractices, but they are very closely guarded or invigilated. Then you have socialization, a very good teaching method, which is actually based on what you do outside class. So apart from academics, examinations, we have socialization, which takes place outside class. We may have notes for what we learn in class. For socialization, you have the experience and the exposure to show for it. Features of medieval education. Education was a servant of the church. People who went through school were being prepared to serve in the church. Education was to inspire learners to lead a moral life and obey religious leaders. Of course, anybody who went through school was supposed to be very religious, lead a moral life, and obey the leaders. So self-expression was not allowed. Learners were not given time to express themselves. Play activities were discouraged. It was uh, all work and no play for the learners. Then the ideal student was the one who dedicated their life to self-denial and sacrifice. That was the best learner. Self-denial and sacrifice were very important as a feature in medieval times. Then we have the other part of history of education in the context of Africa. All that we have been talking about is education outside Africa. We had a education in Africa even before the coming of the Europeans. We call that African Indigenous Education, the AIE. This refers to the coherent, meaning reasonable and sensible system of education that existed in Africa even before the coming of the Europeans and the missionaries. So, before the Europeans came to Africa, there was an education, a very organized type of education, which we call the African indigenous education. If you look at this education, it had some ideals, some positive sides of it. One of them was, it was transmitted from generation to generation, although orally. There were no schools, there was no writing, so it was transmitted orally from generation to generation. The theme was to transmit culture and prepare the youth to live effectively in their environment. That was a running theme throughout this African indigenous education. Though different in content and methods, the aims and objectives were similar. Of course, the content and methods depended on the environment. Those ones who lived near the lake learned fishing. Those ones who lived near the forest, they learned hunting. Those ones who lived in the plains, they learned pastoralism. That is what you are calling content and methods. Otherwise, the aims and objectives were similar in all communities. A continuation of the ideas is that this education was only really adopted to the environment so that they can conserve the cultural heritage. So the runners were supposed to learn their cultural heritage and try to perpetuate the same, make it better and better by their day. Then uh, this education explained to the youth that their own future and that of their community depended on the understanding and perpetuation of the institution's laws. Language, beliefs, practices, values and attitudes. So the learners, actually they were trained to believe that if the community was to continue in future, it depended on what they did during their own time. So they're supposed to strengthen whatever they found the community doing through their education. If they wanted to survive 
and the community to survive, they were supposed to undergo through this education. Then you have systems of African indigenous education. There are only two. You have childhood education running from birth to the age of 12 to 13 years. Of course, you know that at this, around this time, Alana is an, uh, approaching adolescence. So each community had its own way of initiating their learners to adolescence. Then the second system is adolescence and childhood education. Not a childhood, sorry, adult education. Adolescence and adulthood education. This one took place from 13 years up to old age. Then we have the content of the African indigenous education. This one developed out of the immediate environment. So we never went to fetch for, for the content very far. What was surrounding us formed the content. We had the physical environment where we had the forest, the rivers, the mountains. We had the economic environment which actually looks at the occupation of the community. Are they hunters? Are they fishermen? Are they farmers? The religious environment means were they, what, what were they worshipping? And you know, Africans worshipped God. Whatever name they gave God, Africans were never idol worshippers. So whatever name they gave to their God, they were worshippers of one God. That one formed the religious environment, God, spirits, ancestors, and then the elderly. Then you have the social environment. How are they associating with each other? How do you bring in people, the youth, the children, and the old, how are they interacting? That one formed the social environment. How do you approach your elders? How do the young children treat their parents? That one forms the social environment. Then you have methods of instructions in African indigenous education. Parents were the first teachers of the child. They played a very important role in educating their child. Before the child joins the rest of the community, parents were the first teachers to play the role of uh, instructors to their child. Then you have apprenticeship, which means internship or uh, attachment of some sort. If another wanted to learn a skill, they would actually go to a specialist for apprenticeship. They were trained on the skill, such as pottery, weaving, blacksmith, etc. These skills were learned through apprenticeship, attachment, or internship. Then you have constant corrections, warnings, and instilling of fear. Africans were very good at uh, constant corrections. If you made a mistake, they never got tired of correcting you. Then warnings. You are told, if you continue doing ABCD, this or that would befall you. Then you have instilling of fear, whereby you are scared to do something wrong because of what would come out of that wrong action. And you know some of the activities were very very severe. Like, you know, for thieves, if somebody was a thief, they were simply put into a beehive and rolled downhill. They drowned in the lake or the river. That was one way of instilling fear so that nobody attempts to become a thief in the society. A very important instructional method. Then we, have a, we come to a point whereby we have Europeans, missionaries come to Africa and establish the Western formal or modern education that we have today in schools. This one began with the Portuguese. The Arabs were the first ones to come to Africa in the 16th century and the 17th century. Of course, they came before the Europeans. What happened is, Portugal came to Africa before the European nations. But they did not have a lot of writing. They never recorded what they did. That is why we may not have a lot of records as far as Portuguese, Achievements are concerned. They never kept many records for the achievements. So missionaries sent at parts of Africa ahead of colonial government. So you know the missionaries came with their Bible, then the colonists followed with their guns. So when the colonists came, the, the missionaries had already set some path for them. The Africans had already been converted to Christianity, and uh, actually they took it as a way of becoming humble. And that is how the colonialists were able to establish themselves among African communities. So during the period of colonization and the spread of Christianity, Europe and other Western world countries introduced what you call formal education. That is the modern education. And actually this one has borrowed a lot from African indigenous education. 
look at the aims and objectives, look at the structure, and you are going to realize that uh, a lot of it is borrowed from African indigenous education, only that ours do not have any records. Then you have the 19th century, where the Christian missionaries came from Europe and brought the foundation stone for the schools we have today. That is what we call formal education, established by the missionaries before the coming of the colonial government. Then we have the period between 1900, that the one is now in Kenya. We have a history of education in Kenya. How did we get the formal education we have today? The period between 1900 and 1910 was a period of scramble for supremacy among many missionary bodies. Of course, for supremacy in certain regions of Kenya. Like if you go to Western Kenya, you realize a certain religion, maybe the Catholics or the Protestants, they were able to occupy that region before any other group came in, before any other missionary group came in. So supremacy means once a group established itself in an area, no other group would come and overpower them. That is what we call supremacy. Each group was struggling to be supreme in a certain region of the country. Then a department, a department of education was created by the colonial government. So the colonies now realized that since we are embracing modern education, we needed a department of education. So by 1911, a department of education was created by the colonial government. That was long before independence. Then with the recommendations of the Education Commission of 1918, we had a mutual partnership between the government and the missionaries. Of course, the government was now ready to provide land to the missionaries and sometimes funds. The missionaries had a role to provide staff, of course, the teachers and the other workers, put up buildings for the schools, and sometimes provide some funds. That is what we're calling mutual partnership. The government and the missionaries joined hands to establish what we have in form of schools. So we needed buildings. We needed land, first of all, from the government. Buildings from both the parties. Then we have the staff and the funds for running the schools. Missionaries always had an upper hand in the running of their schools. Even today, we have missionary schools that are run by the missionaries. You call them sponsors today. They still follow their schools very closely. And sometimes, they try to interfere with other schools that were run by other organizations. So the missionaries were very strict. They wanted to manage their own schools and sometimes extend that management to schools run by other missionaries. Still in the context of Kenya, we have at independence in 1963, Kenya inherited a system of education that was uh, racially segregative among Europeans, Asians, and Africans. That means European schools were the best, followed by the Asian schools, and the African schools were down there, very inferior. That is what we call segregation. The three groups could not mix in one school. Europeans had their own schools, Asians had their own schools, Africans had their own schools. And of course, in that order of superiority, European best, followed by Asians, the Africans last. We have various education commissions that have been appointed since that time. These commissions play the role of reviewing what we have in our education systems. They tell us this one has been overtaken by events or by time. Can we replace it with ABCD? Then you have some of the commissions which you remember very well for their achievements. One of them is the Omidia Commission of 1964-65, which one, the, this commission came up with what we have as goals of education. One of them is a nationhood and a national unity. Then you have the Mackay Commission of 1981. This one introduced the 844 system of education. We have the Coach Commission of 1999. This one came up with the totally integrated quality education and training. We call it TICKET. And this time around, we embrace the idea of integrating quality education and training, academics, academic knowledge, as well as skills. So learn something in theory, then be able to practice the same out there in the field. Then at the moment, we are now implementing a new system of education, the 2663 system, 
which is actually a competency-based curriculum, the CBC. We are now actually embracing the idea of training our learners on talents. So if you are not very good in academics, then exploit your talent, and that one will be able to employ you in the future. So instead of going around looking for employment, a talent can employ you, and you can also become an employer through that talent. And we are actually witnesses of that. People who are very talented in music, in athletics, in drama, they are able to employ themselves and also employ other people. So our hope is that this new system is actually going to solve the problem of unemployment in this country. Thank you very much. That is the end of our lesson four. Thank you for listening and stay safe. I wish you a good session. Thank you. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.